Um, I don't have much to say as the moderator. I'll get right to the panelist here. Um, in, in English and in composition studies, as you can imagine, the, um, the idea of artificial intelligence and um, generative text creation is, is an overwhelmingly dominant um, subject of discussion with, um, with many perspectives. And I wanted to approach this discussion this afternoon by taking a survey of what colleagues in the field of composition are saying. And overwhelmingly, um, my colleagues from institutions across the United States and across the globe pointed me to a monograph called AI and Writing by the composition scholar Sidney Dobrin. Um, believe me when I say, audience, I have never had such a visceral reaction to a scholarly text before. So um, my remarks are mostly oriented in response to the writing of Sidney Dobrin and his assessment on how artificial intelligence um, can mesh with um, writing instruction. So if the values we claim to be central to liberal arts education are true, um, then the idea that there is such a thing as, quote, mundane writing tasks is fraudulent. This assertion, the idea that there are mundane writing tasks, is made by Cindy Dobrin early in his monograph, AI in Writing, and is a sentiment representative of both champions of artificial intelligence as a technological and intellectual curiosity and individuals in the various fields of writing and writing instruction. It is this core conceit that there is such a thing as mundane, that there is such a thing as a mundane writing task that I orient my defense of writing and thus criticism of generative artificial intelligence as it pertains to education. To be clear, while I collect vinyl records and do not take advantage of my public library's robust digital offerings, I am no Luddite. However, like some of my colleagues in composition studies and fellow creative writers have an inherent skepticism towards generative AI. Unlike many of my colleagues in education, though, I do not see generative AI as the end of education as we know it, or at least that is what I tell myself as I ward off the nightmares of a teacherless future. For now, let me return to Dobrin, which has been warmly received in the field of composition studies, who is looking largely at generative AI as a positive technological development and an exciting opportunity to re-examine the teaching of writing. He compares tools like ChatGPT to writing partners and co-authors as a utopian human-machine collaboration. He describes this as the real value in human-machine collaboration is that it allows us to think of Gen AI or generative AI as not only a tool to complete a task, but also a potentially important way to augment our own writing abilities. Human-machine collaboration can free a writer from the mundane tasks of writing, allowing them to focus on ideas, critical thinking, and problem solving. The problem with this assumption is that it takes for granted that many students enter writing classes without a writing ability to augment. And while many good-natured colleagues in the field, including Sidney Dobrin, have developed some exciting ways to include ChatGPT and similar tools in their curriculum, they've clearly not been in a freshman English classroom since the pandemic disrupted education. I urge us to limit our pedagogical disruptions to one per decade at least. The second problem with Dobrin's notion of harmonious collaboration between human and machine is that it forgets, at least in my estimation, what the real goal of a freshman writing course is. Consider the course descriptions of what at least I believe to be two of Ohio Dominican's most important classes, Basic Writing and College Writing I. College Writing I provides instruction in specific reading and composition strategies provide students with the skills necessary for satisfactory completion of typical college writing assignments. It emphasizes the strategies students need for reading and thinking, practicing writing strategies such as argumentation, research writing, summary, analysis, and so on, so that students may build the necessary skills to succeed as college writers. Missing in these descriptions are the idea that writing is a problem needed to be overcame or shortcutted. Rather, it is a necessary skill set that students should practice and hone. If writing is thinking, and writing is communication, and education is the key to upward mobility, I don't know how we can pretend ethically to do our jobs as writing teachers while calling the development of critical thinking skills and the craft of personal expression as mundane. I want to be enthusiastic about the possibilities of gen AI technology. I want to not be afraid of it. 
When ChatGPT first launched, I ignored its meteoric rise in user base. Per Dobrin, within five days of the November 2022 launch, over one million users logged on to ChatGPT. It took Spotify, the popular music streaming app, five months to reach a million users. ChatGPT did it in five days. It took TikTok nine months to reach 100 million users. ChatGPT recorded so many users in only two months. Like many of my colleagues in the humanities and higher education in general, I suddenly was watching this very closely. Unlike many of my colleagues, I didn't see this rise in AI writing as the end of the world. On this point, Dobrin and I agree. When it comes to technology, there's nothing new about the cries of moral crisis. ChatGPT's emergence reminded me, fondly, of the absolutist demonizing of Wikipedia as a cheater's tool, a shortcut for students to evade the actual research process. Now, Wikipedia has become a mechanism for teaching research, writing, rhetorical analysis, and finds its way into most freshman English curriculums in one way or another. Friends here at Ohio Dominican University might have heard my knee-jerk reaction when conversations about AI started. I'm not worried at all. Students have been cheating at school since the dawn of time and will to continue to cheat long after. To students, I had a more concise and completely incorrect take when dared to be able to tell the difference between their work and its work. I would say, the AI uses bigger words than you. I'll know. <laughs> Really, my takeaway was this. My extremely rudimentary understanding of Gen AI, when used in the right applications, is a curiosity, a novelty, akin to the vinyl record I have that plays from the inside out. At first, I was dismissive of the moral panic, which each emergent technology that impacts writing and freshman English, similar existential crises have erupted at conferences and in trade publications. The truth, I think, is this. As Dobrin says, all technologies take two paths. Either they become ubiquitous and naturalized into the background of how we do things, or they become obsolete. Wikipedia, to return to my previous example, is ubiquitous. The moral panic around it has vanished. Typewriters, another technology that once upon a time signaled the end of writing instruction as we know it, has become obsolete. But remember, even writing itself is a technology. Dobrin cites media theorist Gregory Ulmer, who explains that when human culture evolved, from the oral to the literate, the fundamental aspects of everything about humans and cultures changed, some better, some for worse. The same thing is unfolding now as we move from a literate culture, a culture based in print reading, writing, and communication, to a post-literate culture or a digitally literate culture, what Almer terms elatracy, which is a very difficult word to say orally. Uh, like shifts from oral culture to literate culture, the shift to digital culture will change many aspects of who we are as human beings. Now, this is, of course, true and something that should be considered deeply, but not, as Dobrin and others argue, a reason to uncritically dive into and embrace generative AI or its use as a fundamental part of writing instruction. At the risk of sounding callous, I wonder how recently Dobrin and others have been in the same freshman English classrooms as I have. And this is not to dismiss the abilities and skills of my many talented students, but rather to recognize what level of writing ability they truly bring with them onto our campuses. In a survey from Best Colleges, 51% of students said they believe using Gen AI technologies is a form of plagiarism, though about 20% said they use these tools anyway. In a May 2023 article published in the Chronicle of Higher Education, student editorialist, Owen oh, Terry wrote that it's very easy to use AI to do the lion's share of the thinking while still submitting work that still looks like your own. Once this becomes clear, it follows that massive structural change is needed if our colleges are going to keep training students to think critically. I don't disagree with Terry that radical and massive structural change is needed in higher education or in general, but I'm not sure why the onus for this change is fully on higher education as it pertains to this specific issue. The survey, which is of course not a perfect measurement of students' attitudes to be sure, mentioned previously that 51% of students believe AI to be a form of plagiarism. You should see how quickly students close the tabs on their web browsers when I walk by during a lecture. They know it's wrong, even without getting into a longer discussion about what constitutes wrong in academic integrity. Unlike Dobrin's insistence that ChatGPT is merely a tool and can merely be an integral part of how students write, the value judgment has already been asserted on both sides. 
I naively dismissed the moral panic at ChatGPT's launch, but now share grave concerns that, quote, ChatGPT would ruin education because of the machines would do all the work for the students. Academic integrity once upon a time was a communal governance, and yet not another surveillance task for teachers to govern on top of their own teaching. Dobrin offers a fascinating history on this. In the 18th century, there were only nine colleges in the United States, and all of them developed academic honor codes which were monitored by students. If someone violated the code, they would face repercussions established by the community. Honor codes were based in part on the desire to uphold ethical behavior on the part of all individual students as representatives of the campus community. I don't want to ask too much of the students who filled the seats of my classes, but a little communal governance and accountability would be nice. Jumping into seeding Gen AI into writing curriculum, in my estimation, isn't going to help this problem. It is going to make it worse. To wit, Dobrin names two common reasons why students plagiarize. The first is an innocent and teachable moment, accidental plagiarism due to a misunderstanding of what plagiarism really is, or even more excusable, a lack of knowledge on the many idiosyncratic citation and formatting practices different disciplines adopt. This I can live with. I can work with this as many of my colleagues surely do. However, the second reason is the point of divergence where Dobrin and others who make similar claims very angrily part ways with my own thinking. Dobrin says many students cheat or plagiarize because of lack of investment in the assignment. It can also occur when a particular assignment is uninteresting or unmotivating, even if the student is invested in the subject area. I won't repeat for you what word I scribbled into the margins of my copy of Dobrin's book here, but the idea that it is, an, it is an instructor's job to dissuade students from cheating, stealing, or any other form of academic disintegrity is an idea I simply cannot abide by. It forces me, not a Luddite, not an old man shaking his fist at the clouds about the kids these days, to wonder how students, some colleagues, and people outside of higher education have such an incorrect understanding of what we do. And to that point, let's ignore academic integrity for a moment. To me, the ethical and moral issues with the use of Gen AI in an academic setting are so obvious, it isn't worth trying to be persuasive on. But talking about what we do in freshman English is worth being persuasive on. Consider this brief history of writing studies from Dobrin. In the late 70s, composition scholars began to study the processes by which writers produce writing. And they developed the ideas of the writing process, commonly identified as pre-writing, researching, drafting, revising content, revising organization, editing, proofreading, and lastly, publishing or submitting. The idea was that if instructors could teach students a reliable process, then students could use that process in any situation where they had to write. Focusing on the writing process shifted attention away from the written product to the processes by which the product is created. I can share with you what word I wrote in the margins after this passage, yes. <laughs> In Dobrin's original and highly triggering assertion that Gen AI can free a writer from the mundane tasks of writing, he goes on to conclude that with his freedom, students can focus on ideas, critical thinking, and problem solving. I ask you all today, what is the difference? What is a mundane task of writing that isn't also a brainstorming or critical thinking or problem solving? And to what extent, and to extend that question a step further, what is the point of writing instruction if we can farm aspects of that subject off to artificial intelligence? What is the point of the liberal arts, if not to study what it means to be a human? Can that pursuit happen if we are not fully utilizing our human capabilities to process this thought? The composition scholarship Dobrin references from the 70s is representative of two movements, expressivism and the later reaction to expressivism called post-process. Expressivism, as the name suggests, not only emphasizes the process of writing as the material of writing instruction, but also values first-person, I-based writing as the mode of expression students use in their work. Again, I ask, can we export personal expression? Should we? The primary tenets of post-process study writing as contextual and situated, not just a process in a vacuum, but a highly social process. Dobrin, in a chapter discussing all the exciting ways Gen AI can augment our study and instruction of writing, details human-machine collaboration as a user who provides the AI with a prompt asking the AI to generate a specific deliverable, an essay, a song, an image, and so on. Again, this takes for granted that students have already developed the critical thinking, reading, and writing skills necessary to launch a project. Furthermore, it strips them of their autonomy and their personal perspective. 
The AI can say what it thinks, not what they think. To return briefly to the issue of plagiarism, we most commonly think of that violation of integrity as the theft of ideas or words from another person. However, the output from Gen AI cannot be attributed to anyone other than the AI itself. Dobrin offers that we may need to rethink plagiarism in terms of the artifact, the thing which the information can be plagiarized, instead of the author. The problem, again, is that the outcome of freshman English is more centered on teaching the students the process, not the product, nor the artifact. Skipping the process of developing the artifact is a far greater loss than toiling over how to properly cite its soulless artifact. Show your work, every math teacher told me as I moved up the years, more slowly in geometry, I might add. I now have an even greater appreciation of this pedagogical sentiment. Do I wish the last several minutes didn't sound like an unhinged rant as I face my own obsolescence? Yes, of course I do. But I also wish the conversation in writing studies and in composition studies around the future artificial intelligence seems to be forecasting was better rooted in the history of composition studies itself. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Murphy. All right. Um, thank you for having me. This is a fabulous forum for this discussion. I was tempted to have AI write my remarks. Easy enough to do, right? But I resisted, so we're limited to just my experience as opposed to the vast wealth of info out there. Um, so I don't proclaim to know everything, at least not as much as AI. My own experience with AI is through um, conversational NLP pro natural language processing programs. And I um, feel a certain duality in that. There are times where I'm testing out a conversational app and I'll look at it and I'll see the response and I'll say, wow, that really sounds like me. And then I'll start to think that's what I would say. And then the next thought is, is could this replace me? So you have a bit of wonder and amazement and then a little bit of reservation about what's going on or where it can go. And we see this type of duality with technology and people in general. People love the concept. There's a lot of wow and wonder, but then fear and anxiety can creep in of the unknown, of the unexpected. And people wonder, where is this going to take us? What will, this, what will happen to human relationships, connection, communication, and things like that? And as I start thinking of those things through my mind, I wonder, am I one of those naysayers of previous generations where you wonder, what's going to happen with the telephone? Is the telephone going to stop people from visiting? What about television? Is television going to take people out of social engagements? What about the internet? That type of thing. So I think we have to recognize this duality and look at both sides. At the same time, um, I really um, love Marshall McLuhan's sentiment with Father Culkin. Um, McLuhan was a media psychologist, the original one. And they have a concept, that, a sentiment you've probably heard through many years, but they turned it to look at tools, that we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. And I think that's what we need to look at, is how does AI shape us as we're developing it at the same time? Um, one of the first things I'd like to talk about is smart replies. Everyone here uses smart replies, right? You use that in text messaging, you use it in emailing. It's those automatic responses that speak for you. And there's some good research on use of that type of processing or that type of AI. What we find in research is that it can help strengthen interpersonal communications. It can help with connection. People will feel like the other person is cooperative. They'll feel like the other person gets them, right? It speeds up communication. And some of the programs can help you say things you may not have been able to say on your own, right? It can be tailored to sound like you. And over time, it can pick up your tone, your style, and it can sound just like you, a wonderful you, enhancing that relationship. The downside, though, is that research also shows us that when people realize AI is on the other side, they're taken aback. They do not like the concept of the fake communication with a fake person. They get a little distrustful, right? And so they like the end use, but they don't like the way they get there. And so that's a duality being able to use it effectively, but not so that it overtakes and that you start to distrust that other person. Another um, 
behavioral thing I think we need to look at is how people are behind screens, right? People behave differently when they're working with technology at home with their screens. I refer to it as the bunny slipper effect, right? When you're at home, you're comfy, you're wearing your bunny slippers, you're looking at your iPad or whatever on social media, you can become different, right? The downside is, is that sometimes people will say things to other people that they wouldn't say directly to their face, right? We have things such as adult bullying, adults that say things to others that are cruel. You know they wouldn't say those things directly. But you have this sense of a veneer, this removal from humanity because of that screen. They kind of lose sense of that relationship and connection. On the positive side, though, is that for some people, they can be more honest behind a screen, right? For some um, young adults or growing youth, developing youth, they can practice things like conversations, work on social confidence, social anxiety, and develop skills. And then you can program in nudges through AI to then get them out to socialize, right? So it can be confidence building. And we also can see some very good therapeutic uses. Often, people find it very hard to get through a therapist's door. It's not uncommon for people to want to go and just not show up. It's hard to sit in the therapist's chair. So AI applications can do a good job of being, for therapeutic uses, can do a good job of being available, be a first step for people to try to get treatment, and research meta-analyses look at at this look that um, there's high satisfaction, high retention rates, and they can do a good job with basic mental health well-being issues. I kind of like to look at it though as building a toolkit as opposed to severe mental health disorders. And I think we make, need to make a delineation at that point. If you're going to work with a virtual AI therapeutic assistant type thing, it can be good in the moment. It can be accessible 2 a.m. if you're in the middle of a panic attack, a crisis, something like that. And it can do a fairly good job at some diagnosing, just like with the medical field. It can do some very good jobs of diagnosing. However, with severe mental issues, you need to really still have a person, a, cl a trained clinician. And there are some diagnoses that I don't see will ever fit with um, technology. Maybe things such as paranoia and delusions. Technology is generally a no-go with those types of symptoms. One of the things we can see with, um, again, as an oversight is with a clinician is that you have issues about data privacy, confidentiality, but I think it can be a good partnership with someone to at least help them when the therapist is not there and as a stopgap. And I've seen some amazing technology where apps can be used to ameliorate loneliness in older adults. Um, unfortunately, this has been developed since COVID, but going forward, I think it could be very effective to help those that don't have the daily interaction they need to at least get some type of connection and feedback. One of the questions that I hear or people wonder a lot is, can AI be empathetic? Right? That's an important part of who we are, is being able to show empathy. And in my work with a tech company, I, I, I do see some very empathetic sentiments. Right? It's kind of stunning, stunning to see how empathetic it sounds. Um, AI cannot look at visual clues of the face, which is important, or I'll put a caveat. There is some pairing of cameras with AI, so we're kind of getting there. Um, some AI can pick up the nuance and tone and style of a voice, and we have voice cloning that you can actually input a real voice. Um, so we're kind of getting there with voice, but we're still missing touch, right? At this point, AI does not do touch well. So we still need that human interaction. Um, so outside of therapeutic uses, of course, there's a lot of other uses within um, our society and culture that I think are important. Productivity, when we talk about creative writing, um, not a replacement per se, but it could spark creativity, hopefully, right? <laughs> um, things like problem solving, it could help people problem solve, it could be a good foundation to jumpstart. We see some, some uses within business sectors and stuff that it can increase productivity, help people free up daily mundane tasks that then they're freer to be more creative or use the more critical thinking skills. So I think there's some very positive uses you know, throughout society, but there's always in the back of your mind is will it replace my job? Can it replace me? 
Will people be more isolated? Will it change our brain? I think these are all very valid questions. Um, what my thought is so far is that it's not going to replace the human interaction that we need every day, right? It's a good stopgap, but it won't replace us and that human connection, but it'll change it. It'll change our brains. We know that our brains have plasticity, right? We build neural, new neural networks easily, different ages, and some of that's very good, but some of it may not be so great. The more you stretch one area, the more other areas might not be as defined. We can see some differences already with uh, um, texting, that the somatosensory areas of the brain are changing because of that simple neural pathway differences. Things like memory may change. Um, I used to win spelling bees. I tell you, I probably could not do that now because of my reliance on spell check. So things like AI, if you use that for memory, it's going to change how you might remember, might change how you encode, how you can consolidate, and how you retrieve. And we might see some of, those, some of those other changes. Hard to say whether it's good or bad. It depends what else is being used to compensate and what else can be stretched. I think there's some very positive changes that can happen with critical thinking and decision making if you have a base foundation first and you use that as an aid, not as a replacement. Same with communication, an aid, not a replacement. I think one of the most cautionary areas is if we look at youth and how their adult, how their brains are developing and social interaction. There is some research showing that for youth, during critical periods of development, if they spend too much time in technology or away from social learning, that can have a negative impact, right? In fact, our Attorney General has put out notice of alert for that, that we need to do a lot of research in that area and have oversight, intentionality of usage, and, and such. Um, so overall, I think it's very positive, of course, in our society. We're going to use it, but we're going to always have that caution of how it might take over. Um, and the last question I hear a lot is, will it make people isolate, right? Will they be drawn more to AI and less from other people? And I think we can see that already, that that possibility may be there when things like parasocial relationships, that's where people feel they have a relationship with a celebrity or someone else, but it's on screen, it's not a real relationship. I think that's a potential, but unless there are other mental health issues, I think a mentally healthy person won't confuse the two. Right? I don't think it's likely that they'll confuse the two. And outside of addictive t tendencies that might occur with some types of people or with youth that have still you know, developing the skills, I don't see it as a long-term negative at this point. So, thank you. Thank you. I think we'll hear from our final panelist, and then I'll have some questions and discussion, and then we'll open things up for further questions as well. <coughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Um, first off, I want to say I really appreciated the words from my pa fellow panelists. I think they brought up a lot of very valid points. And I do want to take some time to extend an olive branch to uh, my pan fellow panelists, both in the uh, humanities and the hard science, or the soft sciences, I should say, or the social sciences, uh, I should say. Um, and I, I think it's an important uh, thing to do as to address some of the concerns that were brought up. I think it's very, very valid concerns that you both have brought up as it relates to this technology. And I hope that I can help to assuage that by first demonstrating how the technology works, and then from there going into how we can apply it in ways that make sense on a pedagogical level in addition to on a healthcare level in the case of the psychological needs of potential patients. So. And the first point, what is AI? So the generative AI that you both are referring to here, uh, the chat GPTs of the world, let's just say, is really very much a subsection of a subsection of a subsection of uh, artificial intelligence as a field, right? So we have artificial intelligence, which is a very nebulous concept uh, for a lot of people and a very uh, nebulous field when taken on its own. But as we drill into it further, we see uh, subfields such as machine learning, where we have supervised uh, training or unsupervised training of different models through either reinforcement learning or neural networks. 
uh, which when we specialize and focus on neural networks and we dig into those further, we see deep learning, we see the expansion of these neural networks and the scaling of them in a way to be applied through things such as neuro linguistic programming or uh, in addition to that, um, different mo other different modalities such as visual arts or audio or um, video, different types of modalities in which this technology can be applied where we finally then get to generative AI specifically is when we see these models being sufficiently scaled through what is known as the transformer architecture in a way that allows them to take in any input modality. Let's just speak on text for the sake of convenience uh, and determine based on the positions of words, uh, what word then follows uh, preceding the other words based on its position within the input and what likely outputs would then be received. And it's just a process of repeating that over and over and over and over again. And that's really all that autoregressive transformer models are, right? So with that being the case, given that we understand that this is just a very good next word predictor, in the case of things like ChatGPT, GPT-4, Gemini, Claude, whichever model you're using for the most part, it operates in a similar type of process with the transformer network architecture. Not exactly the same, of course, but it's worth keeping in mind the rough conceptual idea. I think con conceptual ideas are important here when trying to really understand the technology and where we all fit in. So with that being said, uh, I want to first, uh, as a former English major myself, I do want to identify that I, I completely agree that there are very valid concerns there. Um, uh, but I do want to also mention that while I, I don't think that there, while I don't think that there are any mundane tasks, uh, having done a lot of copywriting in the past, there are certainly some tedious tasks as it relates to writing. And I do see this technology being very helpful in that capacity. So for example, if you're at a point where you're trying to say, understand a text, maybe you as a student have a lot of what you might consider to be stupid questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in class and wouldn't bother asking otherwise, you might end up uh, then applying those questions to a model that isn't going to judge you or you're not going to feel questioned by. And it can give you a relatively good way of considering things in this form of ideation you can get from these models. I think ideation is often an undervalued and underlooked at uh, skill set necessary in the humanities for creating content or getting started to begin with or breaking things like writer's block right down with the figurative sledgehammer that is generative AI. So that's certainly a way that you can approach things uh, on that end. And I do very much uh, want to also mention for the sake of psychology as well, I have seen uh, artificial agents or artificial models developed with an emotional intelligence that you don't often find in many people. So I completely agree with you that it is a very good stopgap in the same way that eating a hot pocket is a, a decent meal if you're starving. But ultimately, <laughs> it's not the same thing as having a home-cooked meal, right? So these are a lot of things that we have to consider as well as it applies to these technologies. So I agree with you both in the sense that I think there's an inherent duality that, at least in the humanities and the hard sciences, of which I've been educating myself in both, uh, things tend to come back around. And in the hard sciences, that moment, that sort of chat GPT style moment for them was the calculator and where things really made the difference for, for a lot of people in the hard sciences, particularly in mathematics. And I feel like this is our calculator moment for uh, things in the humanities and the arts and the social sciences, where we have these tools that can extend our capabilities when used properly, but not as a replacement for understanding the core fundamental approaches to developing art, to understanding the psychological needs of given patients. And there's still a lot of open legal questions that relates to applying these technologies, such as HIPAA laws and potential for HIPAA violation, depending on where that data is going, who owns data, whether or not your data is truly private within these models and how they're used and trained and applied in different fields where there might be high risk scenarios that you need to be mindful of. So I think these are really valid concerns as well in that we can ultimately figure out ways to address them that still meet the core needs of people in academia who might have reservations. Because going back to my initial point about how these models work, their fundamental flaw, the core element of them that ultimately requires and begets the need for humanity to be in the loop and to remain in that loop, is their inability to maintain deterministic output, their inability to have temporal reasoning. So we have these situations where, for example, you want to 
get out a consistent output, and that's not necessarily possible with these models due to the stochasticity, or the stochasticism or randomness that occurs within the statistical inference, or these, the, essentially this guessing of what the next word is going to be based on the previous words, which can be uh, toggled in terms of what words it's willing to explore or consider over others in a very um, non non-random necessarily, but non-deterministic fashion as well. So I think these are important ideas to consider, um, and uh, I think you'll appreciate this metaphor, uh, Dr. De Janeiro. Uh, but the use of these technologies, I'd like to think of them as somebody who's approached writing from both the gardening and architect perspectives, that an architect can find some potentially worthwhile tools to dig up and to refine and to hone into something that might actually be worthwhile. Or a gardener can get a bulk bag of seeds for like a quarter <laughs> and then plant them and see maybe half of them won't even sprout to begin with. Maybe a few of them will pop up, but they'll be awful. Maybe even a few more might be maybe workable depending on how you manage it, but it could go somewhere, but you'd have to plant it and figure out again. And then some of them are just gorgeous and so amazing that they just make the whole purchase in, from the beginning worthwhile and all the effort that you put in. So I think these are really important elements to consider in uh, ap the applications of these technologies, but they are not ultimately a replacement for the skill sets you need to understand how and where they would be used in an appropriate fashion. I com like just as we in grade school take away calculators from students and prevent them from using them for certain uh, math courses, we should do the same for, I completely agree that we should do the same for uh, art and certain English classes, for example, and uh, making sure that they're not available. Beyond a certain point, it's, it's a bit unnecessary to get somebody to do the figurative equivalent of calculating out by hand a sinusoidal equation to a certain decimal point. And the, the figurative equivalent that we would might find in, in the humanities. Um, so that's uh, some, definitely something that I think we should also consider. But in addition to that, um, I do think that there's value in the psychological use cases, as Dr. Myers had put it as well, um, but not in a way that ultimately detracts from the needs of an individual patient on a psychological level, on, on their, in their psychological needs and or a replacement for engaging with people entirely but ultimately, as she so eloquently put it, as a stopgap to address certain concerns um, and using that as a means to scale up one's capacity as a medical professional working with people with um, psychological conditions. And in addition to, again, one more point to the humanities that I think is, is worth noting, it's important to also consider the needs for where you want to really, what you really want to get out of applying this technology. Like for example, if you wanted to teach people to be amazing copy editors, having them work with these models and pull out content and pointing out where it's wrong was a case example that I'd uncovered during my time looking into potential use cases within academia and having it criticize these, uh, these immediate outputs that you might get out of these models. I do see value in that aspect of really paying attention to words and phrases that we don't often find in a lot of academic courses when we're focused too much on uh, literary uh, sources and history of our language outside of the technical and structural understanding of why the written word is, what the written word is trying to convey as we understand it within the field. So these are just a few things that immediately come to my mind, but there are absolutely a lot of significant concerns and risks that we should all be mindful of as well. Again, I've already mentioned the data privacy and data ownership. Who owns the data from the input? Who owns it from the output? Can they train on your work? Should they? Should it be an opt-in or opt-out process? How much should you get paid? Uh, these are all things that I think are very important to consider for people in the humanities. And for people in the hard sciences to honestly reckon with, because they outright ignore it in some cases, and I find that extremely frustrating as well. Having come from a background in the humanities, I, I do think that there's often a, a gross oversight that occurs with people who focus too much on the technology at the expense of everything else, and everyone else for that matter. And ultimately, I don't think that this technology will replace us, but even if it got to a point that it did, uh, I don't think it would necessarily turn out as a sort of Harlan Ellison style, I have no mouth, I must scream moment here. So it's important to be fairly grounded in where the technology is at, where it could potentially be going. And that's one of the reasons why I advocate for people to learn about this technology. You don't need to use it, you don't need to like it. By, by all means, dislike it, please. <laughs> but ultimately, I, I think you should understand 
what it can potentially do and what are its downsides for all of you here today from, uh, from an academic level because it's impossible to really build a brighter future when you're potentially ignoring some really useful pieces. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe to start things off, one question we could uh, clarify. Uh, you have referred to generative AI versus other forms of AI. Um, maybe some examples or a definition of what generative AI is as opposed to other forms and some examples. I think chat GPT is a kind of generative AI, which is what you're most concerned with. Maybe we could say more about that. Um, yeah, I will attempt to recall the definition. <laughs> Um, but the way that I understand generative AI to function is you, you give it a prompt and it um, goes through a process called scrubbing. Uh, is that, I might, I, might I might pass this question. You feel, feel, feel free, I can answer I, I'll, I'll this question. If, uh, we'll Dr. Myers, together. would you like to take a stab at it before? I'll defer to you. I appreciate that, thank you. I don't mean to stump anybody. I'm more familiar with NLP. <laughs> okay. so, uh, that form of generative AI with text is one way in which it can be applied. There are different types of models within generative AI. You have uh, generative adversarial networks or GANs. You have diffusion models, which you see with the visual art. But it's all about essentially taking an input and then generating an output uh, at a scaled, uh, at a, in a scaled fashion, which requires many calculations between billions of parameters in many cases, uh, bill or billions upon billions, if not millions of calculations. But essentially you're taking an input and deriving an output. And that process uh, is essentially trying to find the best fit either through, the, in the case of the transformer models, which we're seeing with ChatGPT, uh, through just predicting the next word and uh, providing that, or going through a process of removing noise from a static like image, like, like TV static, if any of you are familiar with that, where there will be static on the TV, slowly taking away that static to reveal a specific image is how the uh, diffusion models are also trained as well. So these are just different types of models that can be used to take an input and generate an output as content. So that's my definition, at least, of generative AI. Thanks. Uh, one question that maybe regenerate some uh, discussion. What would you think is a task in writing that's analogous to a calculator. So we, uh, I think that the thinking about calculators and math is helpful for thinking about AI, this new tool. Um, it, it, was, it was new at one point, now we take it for, for granted. What do you see as some things that would be uh, analogous to that, where AI could take over something like adding up large numbers on a calculator now maybe, um, and then we can, or whether you think that it is something that would be good to have AI sure. do? Um, I mean, spelling. Yeah. I, I don't, I, for all my raging, I use a spell checker. Yeah. I use a gra the embedded grammar tool in Microsoft. Grammarly. So I'll, <laughs> I'll cop to that. I use those. I like those. Those work. Those are okay. Oh, so you do like AI. Well. I mean, it's, it's in the spell check. If you're using Grammarly, they use AI under the hood. So, uh, but yeah, I, I agree. I think another good example is the exploration of an intellectual space. Like for a graphing calculator, for example, you graph a particular line in a linear projected space. Uh, you can apply that same idea in uh, a subjective uh, sense where you're digging into a text to figure out different interpretations and exploring the potential interpretations with a given text, such as with Shakespeare, trying to understand why, what are the motivations of Othello? in his process to, um, oh jeez, it's been a while since I've read Othello, but uh, in his, his process of engaging with society that doesn't ultimately accept him, what, what type of motivations could stem from that in terms of his actions within the content of, of the play? How might his interactions with all of these uh, other characters that, that dislike him uh, stem from a uh, racially motivated capacity. Like these are things that could be considered as well in terms of applying this technology in a way that allows you to explore the subjective space of language and how it can come together into something that's a lot more profound and, and meaningful and worthy insight that can be either explored through an actual essay or in, in a discussion on, in a literature class, for example. Thanks. Uh, we still have a few minutes left for panel discussion. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll go down the line here um, and uh, pose this question. 
If you think there's one thing that people outside your field don't understand that you'd like to correct, or one misconception about like writing English or psychology or designing AI, um, what, what do you think that would be? I don't mean to start. You can start now, or we can start. Anybody who wants to chime yeah, in. Let me let me think. Of, that's a good question. Let me. Maybe yeah, I can start down at the end with the email. It's not that smart. It's not going to take your job. Like that right out the gate. Like it's really not that smart. You think it is? It's, it's not. It, it, there's there's a lot missing there. It can't learn new things from scratch uh, unless you feed it context. And it's even then, what it gives you could be complete nonsense depending on how you prompt it or certain prompting techniques. So I, those are the big two takeaways. Like it's it's ultimately it's inherent randomness that's built into the system begets a need for someone or something to create some level of determinism and applying that output. There isn't, it doesn't just create things independent of any human interaction whatsoever. It needs a human to either start it, to monitor it, or to receive output from it. And ultimately that's part of the reason why, yeah, some jobs might potentially go away, but if you understand this technology, then it's gonna be a situation where you know how to use a computer when we're replacing typewriters for, in favor of computers. It's, it's going to be a similar sort of capacity. Thanks. I think an important distinction in psychology is that people often don't understand the different roles that people in the field have. You can be a psychologist, a licensed psychologist, you can be a counselor, you can be a therapist, and they all have different levels of certification, background, and specialties, marriage and family, alcohol and addiction and stuff. So it can get very blurry or hard to understand what you would need to see a psychologist for, for versus maybe licensed social worker, addiction specialist, that type of thing. Um, and so it can be confusing with, with AI as well and in, in, um, AI therapeutic tools. Um, I think one of the most important things to remember is that a therapeutic tool is going to be able to help build a toolkit. And quite a few people that think they need therapy or they need to see a clinician or a counselor, a large number of them really aren't, don't have a diagnosable issue, right? They need help through a temporary period of feeling down, temporary period of grief, maybe some anxiety, not necessarily diagnosable per se. They just need their... Um, they need some coping skills shored up. They need to learn some how-tos. And so that's kind of where I see the differentiation is that people on their own, if they know, hey, I need to learn how to handle stress better, or I need to know how to work on mindfulness or improve my mood, that type of use I think is, is very productive. But when we talk about diagnosable mental health issues, that's where you need to have the, the clinician or the appropriate designated person step in. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I think outside of my very specific subdiscipline of English and composition, um, I know that students at least enter your typical freshman English first year writing class with the assumption that, you know, we're going to write four essays and two of them I'm going to have to do research. And it's true that those are tasks that you can reliably accomplish in any first year English class. Um, the, the purpose of doing those tasks is to practice transferable skill sets that you can do in your psychology classes and your hard science classes and, and in your careers, regardless of what that career is. So I think that um, something I wish people outside of academia and, and students coming into college and university knew was that I wasn't lying when I said this was gonna be an important class for them. Um, because we're really, we're teaching critical thinking skills and reading strategies which are applicable in every facet of life, career, social, personal, professional. Um, and I just wish more people knew that and didn't diminish it to just be essays where you say what a book or text is about. The author you criticized, uh, Dorn, I think was his name? Dobrin, Sidney Dobrin. Okay, Dobrin. Uh, did he give examples of mundane tasks that he thinks will be replaced that you would disagree with? Um, yeah, I mean, he talked about the pre-writing process, brainstorming, um, you know, um, sorting through sources and, and mapping out various conceptual ideas so that the student could, or the writer, could maximize time spent once the idea is identified. And where, where I push against that idea is that the important skill set is not writing the five paragraph essay about the idea, it's locating the idea and formulating a logical response to the idea. So I feel that in the very specific instance of Dobrin talking about how 
this specific AI technology fits in a writing class. It's that the goal of the writing class isn't the essay, it's the thinking about the essay. And he seems to celebrate pawning that part off, as I understand his argument. So the goal wouldn't be just to have the essay for the sake of having the essay. You're more interested in the process leading up to the essay. I exactly. The fact that AI could get there faster wouldn't be important for you. Right. And um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm old fashioned. Um, but that was sort of the, where the origin of composition studies started with, you know, okay, sure, you can have a, you know, a well-written essay, but like, let's teach thinking yeah. and let's teach the first Absolutely. two steps. That's what's important. Um, I, I think, you know, um, how many people in here who are no longer in college have had to write an essay in your private life for non-academic purposes? I was going to say, some of you shouldn't count and raise your hands. <laughs> Not for work. So, I, you know, I mean, like, I'll be the, I'll, 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 the first day of all my classes, I say, you know, it, like, you don't really need to know how to write an essay. That's, 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 a, that's a technology that's nearing, you know, obsolescence, to be totally honest. But the mental process of formulating the logic to implement in the long form of an essay will, I, I hope, be forever, you know, meaningful and, and important. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's sort of the philosophy that I have towards writing instruction. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to say that I, I largely agree with you um, with a few caveats. I, if that is in fact Dobrin's argument, I would agree the framing is completely wrong. You should, that, that focus that you just pawn it off essentially is just absurd. It's not about necessarily doing like that. Um, I would say there was a Harvard Business uh, study uh, as it related to consultants using this technology. And one of the things that were, one of the insights gained from that was the idea of how people used AI. There were mm -hmm. roughly two types of people. One they called the centaurs and the other they called the cyborgs. Works. So centaurs were people who essentially, pawned off. yeah, yeah, Harvard Business Study, a paper, go figure. But um, yeah, one of the arguments that they had posed was that the centaurs are the people who would essentially just pawn off tasks to AI and let the AI do the work for them as much as possible, while the cyborgs would essentially engage with the material and would collaborate with the AI at every step of the process. And I see, the, I see there being excitement and wonder in that collaboration more than I do uh, see it as a means of pawning away unnecessary tasks. I see it personally as in a means to avoid wasting time because you're just sitting at a screen thinking about what the next word should be or what it could be that you don't necessarily get put word to paper or you feel frustrated or anxious or and that that spirals very quickly for a lot of writers and and one of the concerns that I definitely had uh, during my time during my first bachelor's was working on that sort of process and honing that process but I, I find a lot more engagement and a lot more fun in kind of throwing the idea to the AI and seeing what it can come up with I find that stimulating and as a, as a means of ideation of understanding how this could potentially play out or what are ways that would make sense in terms of what could come next that would be worthwhile and relevant to the overarching themes of uh, an essay or a piece that I'm trying to write or an idea I'm trying to convey within a piece of writing that I'm working on. So I, I largely agree with your critique of many of Dobrin's points because I find that they're ultimately distancing themselves from the craft rather than finding a way to apply this technology as a tool set to enhance one's ability to truly make something magnificent. I chime in about just a, a little bit about critical thinking. I think the advancement of AI is going to put um, a, more of a burden on us to develop critical thinking skills earlier and younger. And when I think about the media psychology part of what I do, there's a push um, in most school districts to push media literacy younger and younger. And the basic tenet of that is critical thinking skills. So, so, that, so students, children can navigate the internet can look at any type of media and discern for themselves, is it true? What am I looking at? Is it a fact? Is it, is it an opinion? And this is something that I say in all of the classes, is go to the original source. And you have to teach people how to think critically so then they can look at it. And when you think about some of the technology, deep fakes, voice cloning, photo editing, those critical thinking skills have to be in there younger and younger, and then really be fi ta you know, fine-tuned in college. So. Thanks. Uh, I think now would be a good time to uh, open things up for, for questions from the audience. Uh, 
Is there anyone who would like to ask the first question for anyone up here? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about, like, it's like bigger picture about like all of society. What do you think is going to be the most impacted and least impacted, either positive or negative? Hmm. Uh, with regards to AI? Yeah, with AI. Okay. It's a great question, actually. Um, I hope you all don't mind if I answer. Um, I, I think uh, any type of knowledge or intellectual work will right out the gate. So, any, so academia will be impacted significantly. A lot of white-collar positions will be impacted immediately. Anything that requires a significant amount of mental labor in order to accomplish a task will be impacted. Now, impacted is a very loaded term in the sense that what, is, what exactly does impacted mean? Does it mean I'm going to be replaced? Does it mean I'm go, I'm go, my position is going to be disrupted? Is there going to be consolidation of roles within my field? Like, and, and that's part of the issue, trying to gauge what exactly is going to happen with regards to that impact. Because the technology is, hasn't really hit the top of the S-curve. And for anybody unfamiliar with what an S-curve is, it's essentially uh, a type of line that uh, starts flat, shoots up although it's uh, as though it's almost exponential, and then eventually flattens out. And most technologies generally follow an S-curve of some kind. And we're still somewhere within the exponential portion with artificial intelligence right now before we really hit a sort of uh, technical bottleneck that we haven't currently discovered through the process of scaling, optimization of models, and the use of better quality uh, both human and synthetic data to train these models. So. I would say primarily in terms of impact, you definitely want to keep in mind any mentally intensive labor, any uh, heavy academic work, any sort of white collar positions, they will all be impacted to some capacity. But again, it, the question in terms of how much and what it looks like still remains unknown even to many experts. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would surmise that um, there are going to be a lot of questions about ownership and, you know, intellectual property that will come up, um, uh, oversight, law, things of that nature. We'll have to wrestle with artificial intelligence and, I, you know, it's not done growing, so we can't really start to regulate it until, well, I, I don't know when, but um, I, I, would, I would imagine that would be an area of, of great substantial change as well. Regulation, absolutely. The EU just came out with some wide sweeping regulation and we're, we're really behind on that. We have some states considering it, but nothing widespread. Yeah, and uh, to the point of regulation, I completely agree. There are a lot of legal gray areas that are very, very concerning right now. Uh, although the executive order from the Biden administration has been helpful at developing an initial framework, it doesn't really go far enough in certain areas, but in other areas it goes a little too far in terms of regulating compute as opposed to regulating at the application layer or regulating applications and how they're used to, uh, to with generated a, uh, generative AI versus the compute that goes into training newer, bigger models. So I do have personal critiques as it relates to uh, current legislation and the lack of legal clarity as it relates to these issues. But I do find at the very least in the interim that there is some benefit to the ambiguity. While we still have open questions about how artists' uh, work is going to be effectively compensated, for example, I do see the benefit of not being able to copyright these works as a means of stopgapping or preventing the use of companies from essentially having complete control and ownership of the data output by these models. So uh, an artist is still absolutely going to be required if you want to have a copyrightable work, at least in the United States. Uh, who does own the output from AI? If I, I use AI to, to generate something like ChatGPT, or what, what's the, the legal status of that output? It's or is that great, what you're saying in gray areas? Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great question, actually. So since you cannot copyright any works based on the US Copyrights Office recent um, ruling, they basically, they're staying out of this, it seems like, until laws are created around it, or legal jurisprudence has determined a ruling as it relates to how this technology can be used and who can own what with the data ownership of it. Um, as of right now, there, since you can't copyright it, it essentially almost becomes public domain. So you can apply it in that capacity, which I think there's a lot of interesting potential for in terms of intellectual, the exploration of what it means to have intellectual property. Uh, and again, I think it is at least a useful stopgap for now because it prevents artists uh, from being um, replaced by a bunch of greedy corporations that essentially want to uh, cut out the middleman in an effort to regurgitate content for their own uh, commercial purposes. If I could just add, 
one thing about the legality is that not just only ownership, but also responsibility if chat hallucinates. Yes. Something goes wrong. Air Canada lost a case recently because their chat bot um, told someone they could have a certain fare and it was against corporate policy. It went to court and Air Canada lost. So they were responsible for the chat bot outcome, output. Yeah, over here on the left side, go ahead. Yeah, I and I think it's I think it's part of a much larger and much more complicated issue at like a cultural and social level, but I I think that something I'm seeing a, a lot in students, um, and even a change between last academic year and this academic year, is the desire to locate the right answer with efficiency. And you know I give a lot of assignments that don't have right answers because those aren't interesting assignments for me to read. They're not interesting assignments for students to write. The problem is, um, when prompted anecdotally, I've observed that students struggle even more with an open-ended question where they, they have to engage at some creative and sort of self-started self dimension, whereas if I, you know, if I ask a really difficult question about a text that they read, if they read the text, um, that's really easy to them, and that just seems to be sort of the opposite of what I had experienced as a student or what um, you know peers of mine experienced even just 15 years ago where we craved those creative open-ended questions and I see um, I see students seeking the sort of black and white answer whether that's um, you know just efficiency or I, I, I don't want to say laziness I'm not accusing students of being lazy but just finding that efficient direct route instead of a sort of inquisitive, meandering, you know, lead with questions, not answers. Um, I, I don't really see that as a skill that students bring with them into first year writing classes. Some exit with that skill, but um, they certainly don't have it in the first week. Yes. I mean, I'll, I'll just say yes, I think that. 
Yeah, yeah. Love to hear. I, I hear a lot of mindset in your question, right? What type of mindset? When we look at Carol Dweck's research on fixed mindset and growth mindset, that's, that's what I hear you speaking to. And we need to make sure we're teaching children to have that growth mindset, all ages, elementary up to high school and college. They continue to have that growth mindset where they'll want to use or they can use AI as a jumping off point, right, to get started, maybe to break that rider's block. And they don't settle on a fixed mindset where they're using it because they don't feel that they can do it. And they're just using it because they're worried about being right or wrong and at least will get the job done without much effort. So I think it speaks to mindset. Right, right. There's fear of failure as opposed to wanting to grow, right? And I think that's the usage, using it not as a replacement, but as a springboard. Sister Joanne. I think that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so I, I should probably have qualified my statement with that these technologies can't learn. So once you've actually trained a model and it's, it's been pre-trained and fine-tuned properly, then it, it, it's kind of locked into whatever knowledge it knows at that given time outside of its short-term memory or its context window for where you can feed in uh, either text or other forms of data to receive outputs. So you can, at, you can have it learn things temporarily through a prompting technique known as in-context learning, where you feed it a bunch of data into its context and ask it questions about that data. However, in terms of it actually continuously learning beyond a given point, because of how it's locked into its fixed parameters, you, a human has to go through a deliberate process of further refining the model, either through pre-training a base model further or fine-tuning a model on particular information. So I, I, that is one of the ultimately the major bottlenecks with this technology. It's an ability to dynamically and continuously learn without human intervention, which is, again, another reason why I'm fairly confident that we're going to be continuing to remain in the loop and why we're very unlikely to elect an AI politician for at least uh, another few years, if nothing else. Chris, please. Thank you for that uh, panel discussion. This was really, really good. And as I was listening to people, I, I've read a lot of articles on the Chronicle of Higher Education, Higher Ed. Academia is very you know, deeply divided on, on, on AI and chat GPT right now. Um, and as I was kind of hearing you guys talk about the technology, there's this idea that there's this wonder, there's this sort of awe with this. And you know, I'm thinking technology in the right hands can do great things. But in the wrong hands, it can do immoral and unethical things. And what we were kind of learning about in the last academic year is some studies that were done, I think maybe by Harvard, that were showing students open, knew that they were cheating and still did it anyway. But there was very little remorse. And all of a sudden, I think for instructors, the burden has completely shifted away from a student to prove they're innocent in case of plagiarism. And it's now shifted upon instructors to actually prove, basically, that the student is guilty of committing a very serious academic offense. I mean, this has been on the rise for years, um, if you will, even before AI. Um, so with this new technology, how do you see this working and moving forward in academia with this tension between, you know, students that are coming in that maybe don't have the records of skills and then start to use this type of technology for sinister reasons that they're, you know, basically committing academic misconduct? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a happy answer to that question, <laughs> but I think um, 
the tension that you describe is is very real and I think it will become more potent and I think it will further divide perceptions and assumptions that students and people outside of higher education have about higher education. I think that, you know, as um, society's value or lack thereof in higher education sort of continues to shift and, and maybe solidify, I, I think, um, I don't think it's AI's fault, but I think that this is one of the many pieces of shifting attitudes towards higher education. And it, it puts teachers in the really terrible position of having to violate the trust of the sort of intellectual curiosity that should be the sentiment of the classroom. And it, it really unfairly puts us in the position of, of surveillance and punishment and you know carceral pedagogy that, that looks for cheating instead of looking for interesting ideas and, and thoughtful writing. Um, I think that we in higher education have a responsibility to clarify what academic integrity is and where AI fits into that piece. But, but I, I think that, that students and society outside of the academy should reckon with the misunderstanding and an attempt to you know, realize what we do here. And, and what we do here shouldn't be input data I, this is not the right metaphor for this conversation, but like, you know, people say like, oh, we pay, we get degree, you know, in, out, uh, transactional, and that's, that's not what higher education is about at all. Um, it's not AI's fault. AI is a part of it. Um, but I, I just, I hear you and unfortunately agree and think it's going to get worse before it gets better. In full public disclosure, I know Dr. Buccinero and, and Dr. Macy, I've talked with colleagues in both departments, so I know we, this has been an ongoing thing, but full public disclosure, we've had this conversation before, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. That is about all the time we have for questions. Can I have a round of applause for the panelists we have up here? <laughs> panelists, thank you so much for your time up here. Thank you for your information, for your insight. It can't be overstated. Before we finish out, I'm going to hand the mic over to Ruth. She is actually the president and the one who has been planning a large majority of this colloquium. She is going to have a couple thanks and a couple closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm the chair of the colloquium committee, and I would like to give a very special thank you to our panelists, our moderator, thank you very much, and our panelists for the back and forth emails and putting up with the chained emails that I sent over the last couple of months. I would like to extend my thanks as well to Dr. Marasida, our honors program director. Um, thank you so much for your confidence in us and with all the comedies. We are truly standing on the shoulders of a giant, and we can't thank you enough for your belief and your encouragement. I would like to thank the university for um, creating these spaces and encouraging us as we pursue our academic careers. Um, there's a quote in King Lear that says, um, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. And we would like to thank you um, on behalf of the colloquium committee of the ODU Honors Program for all your faith and um, creating this space for us. I would also like to thank everyone who's been running behind the scenes. A special thank you to Stephen Brunson who helped us uh, set up as well as Wolf Waster and Mark Weaver for the audio and videography. I would like to thank uh, Ms. Monica Martin in absentia as well as Mr. Jeremy Sony who helped us with the graphic design design and putting up the flyers and the posters. This is the first colloquium we've had in a couple of years and without a reference point for many of us who are in the current class, it was a little difficult to try and envision and see what we want this to be, but they truly made the vision come alive and we are so grateful for that. I would like to also thank the events planning committee which helped the colloquium committee put this all together Alone we would have gone fast, but together we went far. And so thank you so much for um, running the race with us and making this event what it was today. Last but not least, I would like to thank each and every one of you here today. We would have been talking to the walls, hoping for a response, but you came and we thank you so much for your participation today. I would like to um, remind everyone that we do have refreshments in the back, so please make sure you stop by, get something, and I would like to officially open up this time for our uh, time to socialize, network, um, as well as just to continue meeting people, and you can take some pictures if you want to as well. Thank you so much for coming to our colloquium committee. I dubbed this the return of the colloquium, and we hope to see you next year again. Thank you. Thank you very much.